So if all we have is risky assets, then the investment opportunity set is just comprised of all points on the efficient frontier. Either we can say that that's going to be given our uh, level of expected returns, a point that gets us the minimum risk for that level, or we can say that given a uh, certain level of risk, that's a point that gets us the maximum possible expected return. And of course we can then connect this to the capital allocation line, which will then let us combine the efficient frontier with the risk-free asset. Now how could we do that? Well remember, any point on the efficient frontier is essentially a pretty good uh, risky portfolio. So let's just draw a capital allocation line through a point on the minimum variance frontier. We've got our global minimum variance portfolio. So we can actually uh, draw our capital allocation line through that. Remember, this essentially means that we will be now investing in a portfolio combined or comprised of the risk-free asset and the minimum variance portfolio. And by borrowing at the risk-free rate, now assuming that we can indeed do so, or again substituting a kinked capital allocation line if we don't want to make that relatively restrictive assumption uh, and we want to borrow at a higher rate, we can still figure out what our capital allocation line would be even if we invest more than 100% in a minimum variance portfolio. That would take us up here. Now, it's worth asking, can we do any better given this efficient frontier? And of course the answer is yes, right? Um, what if we moved from the minimum variance portfolio up a little and we drew a capital allocation line through this point on the frontier? That would have a higher slope and a higher sharp ratio, right? So uh, can we actually increase our uh, indifference curve that we are on can we actually get a higher utility? Well, the answer should be yes. Like right now, for example, let's say that we are on this indifference curve. We'll denote it as U bar. Well, what if we go to a different uh, capital allocation line on a point higher on the minimum on the uh, minimum variance frontier? Well. Let's see what happens. Of course, our capital allocation line will then have a steeper slope, right? So now we'll be able to get on perhaps if before we were on one indifference curve, now we can actually get on a better indifference curve. Remember, higher indifference curves mean higher utility simply because for the same level of risk they have higher expected returns and therefore higher utility. And indeed the steepest capital allocation line that we can draw is one that is tangent to the efficient frontier of risky assets at some optimal risky portfolio because well we have to be tangent we can't go any higher because then there's no risky portfolio that we could actually feasibly construct that has a higher sharp ratio than this one. So this is the optimal risky portfolio in terms of its trade-off between risk and return, in terms of its sharp ratio, and that of course means that it has the steepest capital allocation line that lets us get on the highest indifference curve possible, and this would be the uh, risky portfolio that everybody would want to hold in some uh, proportion. It would just depend sort of on their particular utility function, whether they would want to be here on this capital allocation line, partially invested in the risk-free asset, or here on the capital allocation line, uh, actually borrowing at the risk-free rate to, have, to hold more of the risky portfolio. Uh, but everybody is going to make some decision on this red line simply because this is the highest sharp ratio that one can realize and therefore the 
highest utility uh, that they can obtain given the discussion uh, that we had prior to this. So to maximize the slope of the capital allocation line is therefore essentially to maximize the reward to risk ratio, the sharp ratio, and therefore to maximize utility. Now, this does suggest that all investors will actually be on the same capital allocation line. It just depends on where they're going to be relative to their investment in the risk-free asset and the risky portfolio that we'll call M, because remember we conjectured that's going to be the market really that will have the highest sharp ratio due to the fact that we've diversified away all of this idiosyncratic risk and so really all we're left with is the risk that is priced. In other words, the risk that goes into the risk premium that the market portfolio earns. So we can call this, uh, and we do call this, mutual fund separation. In other words, the idea that despite a heterogeneity of risk preferences, all investors uh, will actually, according to this theory, uh, end up holding the same risky portfolio, which we can think of as a mutual fund, um, that will have, let's say it's the market portfolio, essentially the market-weighted uh, proportions of all of the risk assets in the market. And it'll also hold a very simple mutual fund, which will just contain a risk-free asset. So since it's really diversification that drives the attractiveness of the sharp ratio of the optimal portfolio, it indeed must be very well diversified. And the reason that this theory really is so appealing is that there's quite a bit of empirical evidence for it, in that a lot of people will actually hold some sort of mutual fund that is pretty close to the market, like let's say an ETF like SPY or a market tracking uh, mutual fund that'll be closely correlated with the S&P 500. Um, and then of course, again, the risk-free asset would just be potentially as simple as one risk-free uh, bond or maybe a treasury. Now, can we actually identify what the optimal risky portfolio would be? Um, again, to build intuition, let's just go through a simple two-asset case, but then we can consider a more complicated one. The expected return um, and variance for a portfolio with two risky assets can be expressed in this way that we have done so often now. We've got the formulas for both of these quantities. We know that really we just need one weight to get around these formulas because if we know the weight in asset one, that'll tell us the weight in asset two. And we know that the slope of the capital allocation line through any risky portfolio or the sharp ratio of that risky portfolio will just be this ratio of the risk premium relative to the risk free rate for the portfolio relative to its standard deviation. Now we can actually plug in our formulas for the expected return and for standard deviation. And we can actually then express what the sharp ratio would be, literally by plugging in mu p, our expression for it over here, and plugging in our expression for sigma p down here. This will actually tell us an expression of the sharp ratio in terms of sort of the primitive givens, the expected returns on asset one and asset two, the risk free rate and the variances of asset one, asset two, their standard deviations and covariance. So let's say that we actually will use the same premise we were looking at before, a standard deviation of asset one of 15%, 20 for asset two, expected return of 10% for asset one, 15 for asset two, correlation of 0.2, and a risk-free rate of 5%. Now, while we were working out our minimum variance friends here, we actually came up for, with uh, formulas for the mean and the standard deviation of a portfolio in terms of 
uh, the weight on the first asset given the values for the expected returns, uh, standard deviations, and correlation between these two assets. And these formulas were as follows. So let's actually substitute these into our expression for the Sharpe ratio and then maximize it. Now why do we want to maximize the Sharpe ratio? Well, because that's going to be the portfolio that is the farthest up the efficient frontier that we can go. That's going to be sort of the highest sloped capital allocation line that is still on the efficient frontier. And it'll be a tangency because that's as far as we can push it in the expected returns direction. And if it has the highest Sharpe ratio, which it will by definition of us maximizing Sharpe ratio, it's going to be the one that has the highest then tangency or ta has a tangency to the highest indifference curve. And therefore is the highest or the most utility maximizing uh, capital allocation line we can construct. So what risky portfolio would get us to that capital allocation line? Well, this maximization will tell us, because remember, it's going to tell us the optimal portfolio weight, and then that'll be the weight on asset one. We can subtract that from one to get the weight on asset two. That will be our optimal risky portfolio for this uh, simple two-asset example. So here we're going to have to take an application of the quotient rule because essentially we've got uh, W both in the numerator and the denominator. And if we do, we get this expression, which we can then rearrange to get the expression below. And now where we have this uh, sigma p square, we can actually substitute in our formula for sigma p square again, which is of course this. The variance of our portfolio is a function of the weight on the first asset. Now all we need to do is simply collect terms, and we actually see that the w squares will cancel, so we actually don't have a quadratic equation, we simply have a linear one, and we can actually solve for w by just moving the 670 over to the right hand side, and we see that the optimal weight on the first asset is 41.7%. Now given that, we can actually calculate then what the expected return to the optimal portfolio would be by plugging it into our simplified formula for the expected return, and by also plugging it into the formula for the standard deviation of the optimal portfolio, get the standard deviation of that. And the Sharpe ratio then, which will be the ratio of those two, except the expected return minus the risk-free rate, of course, that'll give us a Sharpe ratio of 0.55. Now, is this good? Well, it's higher than the historical average for the S&P 500, but on the other hand, this is a conjectured example, so maybe it can't it really be benchmarked against real historical data? Let's benchmark it against the optimal, or uh, sorry, the minimum variance portfolio instead. Remember, we had calculated the minimum variance portfolio to have an expected return of 11.6%, a standard deviation of 13.08, so we can just get the risk premium for that by subtracting the risk free rate take that ratio over standard deviation to get the Sharpe ratio of 0.508. And indeed, we see that we are better off drawing our capital allocation line through this optimal portfolio because our Sharpe ratio on the optimal portfolio is greater than the Sharpe ratio of the minimum variance portfolio. We can compare all of their characteristics. We can see that the minimum variance portfolio places more weight on the lower risk asset, which is not surprising. Consequently, it has lower portfolio risk than the market optimal, or sorry, the market or optimal portfolio. But the optimal portfolio makes a better risk return trade-off, especially once we take into account the risk-free rate than the minimum variance portfolio does, as evidenced by its higher sharp ratio. So what does that mean? That means that if we think 
as, as an investor who is choosing where to allocate their capital, they're going to want to hold some fraction of this optimal uh, portfolio in combination with some amount of the risk-free asset. And that means that they could be either at the optimal risky portfolio directly or a bit below where some of their portfolios invested in the risk-free asset or somewhere above where they're actually borrowing at the risk-free rate to invest more than 100% in the risky portfolio. And indeed, an investor can move up this steepest capital allocation line with the highest sharp ratio equal to that of the optimal risky portfolio. Assuming, of course, that uh, we actually can borrow at the risk-free rate. If we can't, then the kink in the capital allocation line may be somewhere a little bit lower, perhaps, with a slope like this. Now, where we fall on this capital allocation line will essentially depend on our risk aversion. In other words, if we are more risk averse, perhaps if we have a high coefficient of risk aversion, we're going to fall somewhere around here hold more in the risk-free asset. If we have a low coefficient of risk aversion, we're going to go somewhere up here. And actually perhaps borrow at the risk-free rate or borrow at some uh, rate above the risk-free rate um, to invest more in the risky asset. But uh, this is sort of a graphical illustration of this mutual fund separation idea, everybody is going to be holding some proportion of this optimal risky portfolio. And they're all going to have the same uh, individual weights on the risk assets in that portfolio. In other words, that weight that we calculated for asset one, everybody's going to have proportionally that weight to asset one relative to asset two in the risky portfolio. They might just hold more or less of both, but the proportion of one to the other will be constant. And then whatever is not invested in the risky asset will be invested in the risk-free asset. So this is the simple illustration of how we can create an optimal uh, portfolio and therefore the steepest capital allocation line uh, with just two assets. This was useful for sort of exploring the math. Um, in the next discussion, we'll go through an example of how we can actually create a more functional, uh, but perhaps a bit more opaque uh, capital allocation line for a multi-asset portfolio. Thanks for listening.